on your Sunday clothes. There's lots of world out there. Get out the brilliant teen and dime. Greetings and salutations to thee, my captive audience. Because seriously, why else would you be watching this? Anyway. If you haven't already figured it out, I'm going to be talking about posthumanism and how it relates to Pixar's WALL-E. First and foremost, we need to set some ground rules and definitions because context matters. Especially since posthumanism or any other literary critical theory is essentially a context through which you can view whatever you're looking at. There's always going to be some miscommunication just because we are using an ambiguous language, namely English, but you can mitigate that if you set up some concrete definitions beforehand. So first and foremost, what is posthumanism? The first thing to understand is that posthumanism is inherently a deconstructive theory. More directly, posthumanism rejects the classical idea that the Western European experience is the universal context everything should be evaluated under. This is similar to the same way postcolonial theories reject European centrism, but taken to the next level. We aren't just saying that white straight men aren't the epitome of experience, but that being human isn't even a requirement in the first place. And that the theory is mostly concerned with evaluating old assumptions, not just about human nature, but also whether human nature even has value at all. Which begs the question, what exactly is human nature? If I could give a satisfactory answer to that, I'd be accepting a Nobel Prize not making videos explaining other people's theories. However, there are some assumptions at work here that we can use to help define our conversation. Humanist literature assumes that if something is natural, it must be good, and therefore that human nature, because it is natural, is good. Or at least praiseworthy. By rejecting that just because something is natural it must be good, posthumanists reject the idea that something is bad because it is unnatural. If you've studied Marxism, this probably sounds familiar. That means they are free to explore redefining what humanity should be as opposed to being constrained by what humanity naturally is. That was probably a little confusing, so here's a quick recap before we move on to talking about Wally. At least for the purposes of this video, there are two assumptions that we're going to use for our posthumanist reading. First, that you don't have to be human to be worth consideration. This means that whether you are a dog, a cat, or a toad, an alien, or a robot, your perspective is worth considering in literature, and is just as valid as anyone else's. Second, that human nature as it is now is not necessarily good or desirable. Put another way, that just because humans are a certain way doesn't mean that they shouldn't change on a fundamental level to be better. So, with those assumptions in mind, is Wally a posthumanist work? Eh, yes and no. On the guest front, we have the titular character Wally. Wally is a robot and the protagonist at the same time. The driving force of the narrative is Wally's emotional attraction to another robot, Eve. These emotions are not only portrayed as valid, but as more valid than the shallow and vapid relationships we see the human crew of the Axiom engaging in. But then things get complicated. The problem is that while the robot cast's emotions are portrayed as valid, the emotions portrayed are strongly associated with traditional views on human nature. Work ethic, desire to explore, curiosity, and most importantly, love. The robots are very human in their expression. On the other hand, the biological crew of the Axiom are portrayed as less than human. The portraits of the past captains, all lined up in a pretty row, showcase this rather clearly. While the human race may have survived in space, their humanity has not. They have been reduced to fat blobs whose only interaction with the world is through a screen. In this way, the humans are less human than their robots. And that's bad. Don't believe me? Here's a clip from the movie that showcases all that and more. I can't just sit here and, and do nothing. That's all I've ever done. That's all anyone on this blasted ship has ever done. Nothing! And the Axiom you will survive. I don't want to survive! I want to live! In the end, while Wally does not demand you be biologically human in order to be worth consideration, it does suggest that human nature is superior to robotic nature. Consider that the closest thing the film has to a villain, Otto, is a robot. But not only is Otto a robot, it is the most robotic robot in the film. It speaks in monotone, follows orders with no room for deviation, and it is utterly inhuman in appearance, nothing but a wheel with a glowing red central eye. So what's the final verdict? Well, Wally passes our first assumption with flying colors. After all, more than half the cast is robotic, and they're adorable. That said, Wally doesn't fare so well with the second assumption. While most of the cast are robots, they are portrayed as good because of their human-like qualities. With that in mind, I don't have a firm yes or no as to whether Wally is posthumanist. But that's okay. That's the awesome thing about working with a deconstructionalist theory. You aren't supposed to come to a concrete yes or no answer about anything. The point is to use the theory as a context for a conversation, because that's where changes happen, not in heavy-handed yes or no judgments. And since we've just had about five minutes of conversation, I'd call this a success. Yeah, no, assuming any of y'all are still awake and you heard any of this. Put on your Sunday clothes, there's lots of world out there.